we just met sis, Sister Teresa when we had a pilgrimage in Poland, and uh, it was just a very short encounter with her, but all of us pilgrims there were so uh, odd, <laughs> so amazed what, of what really came out of her mouth as things that we don't really know, knew in the beginning about the Divine Mercy, and we have really thought of bringing her to Vienna to, to share this knowledge, this information about the Divine Mercy. So, hindi natin patagalin, may I introduce to you Sister Teresa. She's a Filipina, of course. Wow. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. I wish to thank very much, first of all, our Lord Jesus for bringing me and Sister Augustiana here. It was a miracle we were able to get here with so many little hoops that we had to go through. And thank you also for Father Ron and all the uh, coordination behind the scenes that made it possible and all the people that have since welcomed us in a very marvelous way. Thank you very much. I feel, it's kind of strange, I feel in a foreign place, but I feel at the same time at home because I'm seeing Filipinos. So it is a, it is a great joy for me. Um, Father had asked that I share about the message of devotion to Divine Mercy, the similar way that I had shared it with the pilgrim group, group that visited, Vien, uh, visited the shrine of Divine Mercy in Krakow, Wagivniki. And as I was thinking about this event, falling on the Feast of Transfiguration, on this first Saturday of Mary, I was so touched. And all throughout the day was cloudy. And you know, in the gospel, it was, you know, the cloud overcame a sign of the Holy presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, behold, my, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And I thought, this is exactly what this whole message is about. And we start with a kind of a celebration of light, of Jesus in the Eucharist, who is light, and beautifully um, expressed externally by fathers inviting each one of you, me, to come to the altar to our Lord present with a light signifying our hearts. And uh, that brought back to me uh, the, the second letter of St. Peter, the second reading of today, when St. Peter says, we have this, the prophetic message more fully confirmed, which is Christ glorified, who suffered, you know, is going to go through his Passover, his Exodus, and he's glorified when they saw him on Mount Thab Tabor. Um, you will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And Father chose the text from the diary 47, the revelation of the image to Faustina in Pots. It was the first Sunday of Lent that time, 1931, was uh, incidentally, or Diocidencia, providentially also the Feast of Icons. Um, and I'd like to, to, how shall I say it, to use that as our basic starting point with this sharing tonight that this whole meeting, you're hearing me, you're seeing me, you're hearing my voice, but I'd like the heart, your heart to be focused on that lamp, Christ Jesus, shining in a dark place, or Jesus in the image right there uh, before the altar, who is truly present to you right now. We, um, we reposed him in the tabernacle, but he remains present. He is looking at each one of you right now and listening to your heart. And I'd like each one of you to be listening to him right now as I share something, uh, something about the divine mercy message. You know, but something a little bit deeper. I was saying, Father, how, how shall I put it? A deeper look. So that's what I wanted to kind of invite you. If you want to sometimes close your eyes, and if someone falls asleep, maybe a little nod there, <laughs> and a little, a little, little elbow nudge from the uh, seatmate. But that's fine too. The Lord is pleased when it, with his beloved ones. So focus, I invite you right now to continue this prayer of adoration earlier. Take a deep breath. 
That breath is a signal of your life, of your beating heart, which is a gift of God, and He is present in you, giving you life, present in grace if we had not kicked Him out with, with sin. So He's there listening to you. Let us focus our attention to Him as to a light shining in a dark place. And can you imagine if all of us were like that? We will be transformed into light, and we will be light shining in the dark place of the world. So I wanted to share what is this message of mercy. Um, it's kind of like preaching to the choir, to Filipinos, because you and I almost like we grow, we grow up with this message all around the place. The picture is all around the place. The chaplet, the hour of mercy is on television, on radio. But what is it really? you come across people who say, oh, I did the divine mercy, or oh, I, 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 get, I have a picture, or oh, I prayed the, I prayed the chaplet, I prayed the divine mercy. Okay, great, oh, but it's something more than that. Although these are beautiful expression, like when I'm, I was listening to Father's efforts with different people to enthrone the divine mercy image, what a beautiful, expression, external expression. But the, the problem that, that can arise is that we fail to see the deeper reality that of what we are doing when we do these external expressions, whether to have an image, to light a candle before an image, put flowers, pray the chaplet, celebrate divine mercy, feast, three o'clock, which is two different things, of chaplet and three o'clock. Those are external expressions, well known, those are, we call them forms of devotion, no? In Filipino, in Tagalog, or English, forms of devotion. But very nicely put in, in, in Polish, forme kultu, form of worship of divine mercy. So these things, the picture, the Feast of Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday, three o'clock, when the clock strikes three, the chaplet of Divine Mercy, those are means. I like to use the analogy or the metaphor of transportation. You can get from one place to another by using the train, the car, uh, airplane, tr uh, tram, bus. You enter that means of transportation and you get to a destination. Or another an analogy, a playing field or football, volleyball, tennis. You enter the court, you enter the field, and you experience the play. The same with the forms of worship. You, as if, enter into a space of encounter with the divine mercy. Because sometimes we, we, we forget, um, we lose focus, we are focusing on what we are doing. Oh, I did the divine mercy, I did this, I did that, I did this. And then it's finished, it kind of, in our heads, it's almost like, oh, the devotion, it's a certain time, a certain exercise of our tongue, our lips, our heart too, some, you know, sometimes when we are not uh, distracted in our bodies. And then after the prayer, finish, you know, okay, what's next? So I have to clean the house, I have to go home, I have to, you know, get gas or something, whatever. But the focus that this message is inviting us to is the divine mercy. As you know in English, when you put the in front of an adjective, it becomes a noun. So divine mercy, God's mercy, you know, the mercy of God, the, it's an attribute of his, you know, God is merciful, you know, adjective of how God is. But God himself is mercy. And in the, in the encyclical, Divis in Misericordia, Misericordia, Rich in Mercy, it even says the incarnation of Christ, Jesus incarnate, is the definitive revelation of mercy. And in another place, actually, the Paschal Christ is the summit 
of the revelation of divine mercy. In another place, actually, if you look at the, I have it here, the encyclical, I invite you, I invite you to take time this summer month, you know, last few months, get the divine mercy encyclical, the God rich in mercy, and, and, and just dive into it, pray with it. But there, a very, very important focus the divine mercy is the paschal mystery. It says the paschal Christ is the fullest revelation of mercy. And in another place, the paschal mystery is the summit of Christ revealing the inscrutable mercy of God. And it's kind of, okay, paschal mystery. Oh yeah, we, we know, you know, on Easter, you know, paschal mystery, we have the paschal candle, no, paschal candle, or the paschal lamb. Actually, sometimes I ask a group, what is paschal? And they, they can't answer. So what is paschal? The lamb, the light, uh, the sacrifice, more, closer. Paschal is an adjective coming from the noun pasch. Pasch, the Spanish have it easier, Pasqua, which means Passover. And then if you think about it, what is that first ever Passover we heard about in scripture? It's the Passover of the angel over the house that, that's marked with the blood. Remember with the, with in, when the uh, Israelites were in Egypt and they were getting ready to leave? So they were, uh, told, okay, you know, sacrifice a lamb and all, all the rigorous details. And then the, the angel will pass over the house that's marked by the blood of the lamb. And then there's also the Passover of the chosen people to freedom from slavery to freedom, passing over dry land. So when we, then we talk about Christ as Passover, the fullest revelation of mercy, the summit of the revelation of mercy, Pasca, the, the incarnation of Christ, definitive revelation of mercy, it gives us the idea, uh-huh, where should we focus our eyes? On the Paschal mystery. But then what is the Paschal mystery of Christ? It is his suffering, and you have this you know, kind of modern type cross, Jesus crucified, What's next? Jesus died. The death of Jesus. People sometimes forget that. You know, crucified and risen. Uh -uh, one woman. Gets worse. It gets worse. Life gets worse sometimes. That's why sometimes divine mercy is not just an, a nice little um, consola consoling message. You do this and nothing bad will happen. No, not really. Something, something, sometimes bad things happen. So, Christ suffering. Christ who died and Christ who is risen. That is the Passover mystery, the Paschal Christ. And in here, the Pope would refer to Christ, oh, the Paschal Christ, the Paschal Jesus. Why do I belabor this point? Actually, if I talk about this, I wouldn't have talked about it enough because this, my dear brothers and sisters, is the mystery that gives us life that gives us strength, that gives us hope, that gives us light, that gives us peace. If you and I were the devils, if you and I were devils, what would be our modus operandi? What would be our biggest goal? To make sure that souls don't go to Jesus, no? Because if they go to Jesus, game over, no? And where did Jesus accomplish the work of salvation, the work of bringing us close to him? On the cross, in his death, have you watched The Passion? Yeah, have you, you remember that, that film? Remember that moment after the Lord's death? The next scene was the devil shot from the top and he is crying out loud. He, she, he knew he was conquered. In another document, the Apostolic Exhortation on Salvifici Dolores, the redemptive meaning of suffering, there is an amazing statement. It says that the cross and resurrection of Christ, cross and death of Christ, conquered the author of evil. My dear brothers and sisters, 
how powerful that is. And that is the message that the Lord is giving us through the message that he is sending us to Faustina. He is mercy. And where is this mercy? It's not, uh, we, we have beautiful songs and we have to use them because it lifts our emotions up. But devotion is not emotion. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that kind of rhymes. <laughs> devotion is not emotion. That's true. It, but it, it can help though because it can set you afire. But then comes the daily grunt of living, you know, the normal, boring way of living, the choices that we will make, the, the decisions we have to make. And uh, the Lord Jesus, wh how he did it was he asked Faustina, because he was thinking of us, he was thinking of our salvation, and he chose Faustina as his secretary, his apostle, and his minister. Apostle of mercy, I'm sending you to all humanity. That means to you and to me. So that mankind will not fear to draw near to me, pretty much. And the same with secretary. Secretary of my mystery, my most profound mystery. Secretary of my mercy. Your task is to write down everything I tell you about my mercy for a great number of souls. So that by reading these things, they will not fear to draw near to me. So all the time Jesus is saying, speak about my mercy and then he to told her mercy. he told her himself where to find this mercy and all throughout the diary you will see him meditate on my mercy enter my passion meditate on it immerse yourself in my passion and then he gave her these pic the picture the feast of mercy the chaplet of divine mercy the hour of mercy and do you see all of that what unites them all? The Paschal Mystery. The picture before you, if you look at it, it is the picture of the Paschal Mystery. Jesus with wounds in his hands and feet, the sign of the crucifixion, the height of his suffering. You see the rays coming from his heart, but not visible. If you see the heart in the picture, it's a wrong picture, because so Faustina never saw the heart. And Jesus told her, I want, you, I want to have a picture painted. So. But when did that occur? In John 19, remember? When he was already dead, a soldier came and pierced his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. I once was, I had a conference with doctors, and then I was seated with them after, and one doctor asked me, well, sister, what, why do you think? Why do you think that Jesus, uh, that St. John wrote that line in the gospel? I felt I was in an examination. So I said, well, because he's an eyewitness. So he wrote what he saw. Well, what, yeah, but what else? I said, well, because it's the gospel of St. John and the whole theme is love. God is love, love to the end, you know. I have, you know, they say, well, yeah, but what else? And then I'm looking at her. I don't know, you tell me. And you know what he said? I'm a doctor, sister. I study bodies for causes of death. That is a sign of death, a clear sign of death. No one could be alive if blood and water clearly separate, flows out from the heart. And then he went into the science of it. You know, it was fascinating, you know, the trauma that there's almost a decantation of because blood is heavier than water and it's, it went down so that when he is pierced, immediately it flowed out, separate. Because you and I, when we bleed, Blood and water don't flow out separate, just blood. So it's a sign of death. And when you look at the image, that's what you see. That's actually the most, the most prominent element of the image. It's a sign of his death. But amazingly, paradoxically, the sign of his death is life for us. How evocative that last moment of our Lord, when he breathes his last. It's really a gift of self. Love to the end. Love is the authentic gift of self. And there is the Lord Jesus on the cross. Giving himself in his last breath. Giving his breath. And remember when he appeared to the, uh, to the apostles in the upper room. What did he first do? He breathed upon them. <sighs> Peace be with you. And so the rays, the sign of death. That's the sign of the church. The sacraments, 
the blessed the holy eucharist which we just had right here the eucharist eucharistic adoration that's what's where our lord is and also in confession so the rays signify the church the holy spirit all the sacraments but especially the eucharist and the sacraments that wash us i was hearing a joke last night with father having so many baptisms and uh, and you know oh you have lavada <laughs> it's like what was that about and it's so beautiful i thought it was so beautiful because exactly the water of christ baptism washes washes our soul but in another place confession washes cleanses strengthens our soul and that's the sign of his death the death of our lord gives us life amazing thing in the diary of Faustina when he says Ile raze, tile raze, you know, as many times as you ask for my mercy for forgiveness that many times you glorify it that is an amazing statement because sometimes we may have the idea of glorifying mercy proclaiming God's mercy in a very external way you know like even for sisters, we might say, oh, speaking about mercy, you know, yeah. Okay, that's part of it. That's great. You know, giving pictures, of course, that's necessary. But that what Jesus is saying, you glorified as many times you ask for my mercy, for forgiveness. That many times you glorify my mercy. And in a different part of the diary, when a soul turns to me with trust, the devils... The devil, the devil goes to the very, actually the verb is flees, flees to the very bottom of hell. Because as I said, the death of Christ conquered evil, conquered the author of evil. And that is why the hour of mercy, the time of Jesus' death is so powerful. Can you imagine if at three o'clock, Okay, we pray the prayer, but in a deeper way, we actually unite with our Lord Jesus on the cross. Because sometimes, like the Lord says in the Psalms or in the prophets, Oh, these people call out to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And sometimes you and I can be guilty of that because of routine, because we do it so often. We can be saying something only with our tongues. But our heart, our head, our interior, our purpose is kind of obfuscated. We're not sure, we're not clear, we're, we're thinking of something else. Faustina is like an arrow, you know, like shot from the bow of Christ's hand, you know. And the, her, her, the power with which she goes the direction towards which she goes is God's mercy, the salvation of souls, because the salvation of souls is the greatest expression of God's mercy. And sometimes, and here I invite you again with this message, uh, salvation, okay, it's the end of life, salvation being saved from death, but we need to widen our understanding of salvation, Re any form of rescue, anything that threatens your good, your person, your interior, your relationship with God, with others, your life, anything that threatens your good, that means you need help, you need salvation, you need to be rescued. And Jesus is Savior, and he rescued us by his death. It is kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? We are Christians, and we are immersed in his death. Like Father, I know how many times today with baptism, two, three, two, you know. What is the right? Remember, you immerse a child. Or, or pour or something, but, but usually immerse into the water, signifying our being part of the death of Christ, and then, and then lift it up 
Father, the priest can say that more beautifully than I can. But the whole idea of being immersed in the death of Christ and then sharing in his victory. My dear brothers and sisters, you and I have that by baptism. We have that in our souls. And this is what the Lord is telling us in Faustina. He is with you. Live sacramental life deeply. Sometimes we look for esoteric solutions, sources of answers. Very simple. Jesus was sometimes asked, told Faustina in, a, in a one conversation. Uh, she, she was writing about a complaint of a soul in darkness. And then Jesus says, you know, why if you complain about darkness covering your mind, why not come to me? who in an instant can bring light to you. That is an amazing thing. And then he says, that is why I have stayed in the tabernacle. See, I have no retinue or bodyguards surrounding me. You can come to me at any moment, at any time, and speak to me. And in a very cute way, actually, I find it really cute, because uh, in, in, in the diary, 1485, 88, 88, 89, the soul is telling Jesus about high, highfalutin stuff, shall we say. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for that. I am sorry I have, con I have, um, I have uh, sinned so many thousand times and deserve hell, blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus says, very gentlemanly, very nice. He says, your words are pleasing to me and they bring down blessings upon you because you know the soul is thanking the soul is act of you making an act of humility it's pleasing to god but you know what jesus says but let's not talk in general about things can you imagine this is what jesus but let's not talk in general about things let's talk in detail about what weighs upon your heart and this is what jesus in the picture is reminding us He's suffering the wounds, his death, but he is standing. In Greek, anastasis means to stand up, to rise. So here in the picture, you have the whole Paschal mystery. And in then, in a very mysterious way, in that mystery is your life. You and I are invited to discover it. Remember in Lent, you heard Isaiah 53 many times as an antiphon, as a response, or as a decoration, like title on a book. It was our wounds. It was speaking about the suffering servant. It was our wounds that he bore, our suffering he endured. That is not a line. That is reality. That means your wounds, your suffering, your pain, your burden, your anguish, your difficulty, your frustration, your anger, which is a suffering, your whatever else, Christ is carrying. On the cross, he was carrying it. And so when we look at the cross, it's not just, oh, a symbol of Christianity. That's a symbol of his love for you and for me. That's a symbol of your suffering being, being carried by another. I have to admit to you, there is a high level spirituality that says, offer it up. And it's very good, you know, you offer up something, a sacrifice. But sometimes for beginners, or for, like Jesus says, a bruised reed he shall not break, nor a smoldering wick shall he quench. Sometimes we are so hurt, so much suffering we are carrying, we cannot even think about offering it up. I know some people that when you talk about, you know, look, this is something about, you can offer this to God, and the response, response is, don't talk to me about God, you know. I have enough of this God. You know, they are upset. And you can understand them because they are angry. What the Lord is asking you and me with this message, 
is to not run away with this pain. I mentioned already Salvatici Dolores, the redemptive meaning of suffering. I invite you, I invite you to read it, especially number 20, 26, and 27. If I can find the quote here, I will share it to you, a very, very beautiful thing that it says. Man discovering through faith the redemptive suffering of Christ also discovers in it his own sufferings. He rediscovers them through faith, enriched with new content, with new meaning. Man discovering through faith the redemptive suffering of Christ also discovers in it his own sufferings. That's kind of an end of a whole explanation he was saying about when we are suffering, we are invited by Jesus to come close to him. And he says, JP2, that to a suffering soul, there is extended an invitation close to Christ. Christ is interiorly close. It's close, he's close to the heart of a suffering person. And he is inviting that person to come close to him. And, and then he says, he, he says that sometimes the journey of the person suffering is kind of long and it depends on how our personalities are. Sometimes it usually typically starts with a protest, with anger, with argumentation with God. And then sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes it ends there. But when one perseveres and fights, like you remember Jacob fighting with the with the in the old testament fighting with that unseen you know angel so to speak if one continues with that suffering to talk with god about it he says a very beautiful thing man discovers at the heart of redemption a wonderful exchange at the heart of that cross and what is that exchange that in the midst of evil something good can be discovered. And what is that? That Jesus is carrying you. That Jesus is carrying your cross. That you are in him. I'm thinking because there's this live thing. I'm not sure whether to share something personal. Uh, maybe in summary, and a little bit... Uh, as you know, I've been in Poland a long time, um, but when I first came, the first year, and those of you who have come here, you experience probably culture shock, and normally it kicks in very, very keenly at the third month. You know, it's like, oh, what on earth is this language? What on earth is this food? You know, it, it kind of, everything irritates you or, or it's painful. You actually... Then I learned how oh, missing homesickness is really homesickness. You know, it's not just a word. It's really painful. So that day I was kind of down. I was thinking about different stuff. I was walking from one place to another in the convent. And then a, a lady comes, you know, sh I mean, so I'm walking with my head down because I'm thinking. And a lady comes, a Polish woman with two other people, old Polish lady. And she says to me, sister, sister. Shostro, shostro. So then I looked up. I said, yes, Prussia, you know. And then she looks at me, uh, uh And then she, she said a word that was very painful. And then and I said, this is not our sister. And then, and then, and then so in my heart, I was like, oh, I was getting upset because I felt, you know, I felt slapped. I felt rejected. But I said, okay, okay, no, Lord, this is your duty to help. Okay, so I asked, can I help you? And then she says, no, I'm going to ask for our sisters. I'm looking for our sisters. And then she turned around and she left. Oh my God, that night I was crying. I went to my room, I was just crying. Jesus, I felt rejected. I felt just like worthless, you know. It's like, hey, I'm talking to you. I can, I can help you probably. But anyway, so she left. I was crying in my room. And then I, there, was some, there was a knock on the door. It was a sister, a tough sister, but very nice. She says, sister, sister, there's a Filipina lady outside. Yeah? She has Filipino food. Really? It's like in Poland. They're like, really? Yeah, two bags for you. It's like, for me? It was nine, eight o'clock something. So then I'm coming out, and it was a lady. I had met her three days ago, and she said, I'm, I'm vacationing here. I'm going to cook you, cook you food. But then I thought it was out of 
politeness. So I didn't really expect anything. No, she's coming there at, at that night, that night when I'm crying on my own. And then she says, she gives me the food. Okay, sister, enjoy, bye. She goes, so then I'm going to my room because I can't go, there was, everything was closed. So okay, I have to go bring to the kitchen this tomorrow. I'm opening, it's the adobo, there's rice, there's pancit. So okay, okay, tomorrow, you know, because it's an evening already. Then I said, open the next bag, turun. I could not believe it. It was Turon. And I associated Turon with, with breaks in grade school. So I associated it with your classmate, with your, you eat it with your friends. Because, you know, at that point, I, and I show my age, it was like 150 peso, you know, like one peso or something. So it was very cheap. It's very quick, like because you had five minutes, ten minutes between classes. You eat it with friends. I felt so much that Jesus was telling me, your friend is with you. I am next to you. You know, I, I, I cried even more after that. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. So then, and then I felt like he was, he was with me. But then during the next days, I said, I needed to pray because I was angry. I was carrying a grudge, which is against the virtue of being merciful. So I said, I have to pray about this because I'm upset. So then I went to chapel and I was, I went to Jesus. Um, I was, uh, Jesus what was that about that woman? That was terrible, you know. So I was complaining, I was complaining about this woman. And then, in a certain moment, I experienced that Jesus was hurt. I was kind of surprised, you know. N nothing extraordinary, you know. I just sensed that Jesus was also hurt. I said, I kind of silenced, you know. And I, but then I continued my pain, you know, my complaints. And then it became even stronger, that sense that Jesus was hurt for me. Not just hurt because it was a painful word that the lady said, but he was hurt for me. And I, and I couldn't believe it because, you know, I was even thinking maybe it was my fault or something that I'm upset, you know, I should forgive. But it was like he was taking my side that... Uh, my pain, he understood. And then even more, he let, me, he let me realize, and this is that knowledge, he let me realize that my pain was in his. It was so much that I said to Jesus, it's okay, you know, <laughs> I told, I, I've changed the focus on my own pain to him, it's like, to, it's okay, it's not so bad. <laughs> and, then, and then when I thought about it, it's just that line from Isaiah 53, my God, that is real. The Lord really suffered for us. And if only we will bring to him our suffering, he will speak to us. He will let us know his suffering. And because then I realized that my suffering was teeny tiny, and it was even there. But he wasn't belittling it. He was showing how precious it was to him, important enough to, for him to carry. And it gave me the strength to let go and to even give thanks because otherwise I would not have experienced that. And I keep sharing that, then, that to people that I, I meet, that the message of divine mercy fully revealed in the Paschal mystery can be understood. I suggest, every, peop, every person has a different road, but I suggest because it is most common, most something that unites humanity, can be started with, the, with our life, with the events of our life, especially the painful events that we bring to our Lord. When you do that, you will discover the suffering Jesus, his love for you, and you can personally say, Christ suffered for me. Christ died for me. And then you will have a strength that comes from his resurrection. Sometimes we don't feel it, but there is a certain lift for you. You can, you can, you know, head up, shoulders back, chin up, you know. You can walk forward because you know you are not alone. This Lord, this God Almighty is with you. And that is the summary of the message. It's right there, this message. I love you, God is saying. Jesus' hand is uh, up, ready to bless. Hand is on pointing. It's like where you want to, if this is a big meme for bloggers, for pic loving lovers of picture, what is this saying? 
Like, look, look at my love for you. Look at what I'm doing for you. Look at what I have done for you. Look at what I want to give you. Look at what is for you. Take. And how can we take? It's in the bottom. I don't know how is it there. Is it in English or, or German or Polish? Jesus, I trust in you. So in, in Polish, it's ufam, I trust. First person, present tense. So now, and amazingly in Polish, it's pod piece, which is uh, literally pod just right down there and a piece of writing. So inscription down below. But it's also the second meaning is signature. My dear brothers and sisters, you and I, when we sign something on a document, we sign our name, you know? And what do we mean? What do we mean when we sign? We mean many things. We attest to the truth. We lodge a complaint, or something, and then we lodge a claim, you know. And then we also commit. This is my my part. What I want to give. How beautiful is the invitation of our Lord, and what He wants you to attest first to, to attest to personally to claim as your own his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, his power. My dear brothers and sisters, here is the source of our strength. Here is where the horizon of salvation of the kingdom of God gets wider and wider. How? Because your life becomes part, becomes closer, and then it grows ever wider. This this movement, this great group of people who are drawn by this divine mercy. And then you say, Jesus, I trust in you. And then you give it because trust simply is your heart opening, opening to him. And he keeps saying, he keeps telling to, to Faustina, tell souls not to put barriers. Tame. I mean, like big, what is that, dams? Or, you know, not to put barriers within their hearts because my mercy wants to act greatly within them. Tell souls to let the door of their heart open just a little ajar and my mercy will come in and do the rest. Then the other thing he was saying about confession, about the power of mercy, we're a soul like a decaying corpse in Polish, uh, how is it? Rozkładające trup. It's almost like a rotting corpse. It was very strong. And and with in human terms, there seems to be no hope of salvation, of restoration. With God's mercy, everything will be restored in full. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the heart of the message that the Lord is giving is giving to us, and it is the Paschal mystery at the heart of all the forms that you and I know so well. The picture, the feast of mercy, which comes at the, at the, at the, the, the octave of Easter, which is the triduum, the triduum, remember the, the Eucharist, Good Friday, Easter vigil, ends on Easter Sunday, which is an octave, and ends on Divine Mercy Sunday, the two sides of the same coin. So again, the Paschal mystery to say, aha, the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord is because of his mercy. He loves us so much. So this one, Paschal mystery, Feast of Mercy, Paschal mystery, the chaplet of mercy, we offer God the Father, the, the suffering of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, hour of mercy. It's all about that. So when you and I pray this and the beautiful litany, Remember, the most important is your relationship with our Lord, living your life within his Paschal mystery, consciously, maturely giving to him your life. My dear brothers and sisters, you will never be disappointed. I, th I think that will end my, my first part. I don't know if that was a bit too long, but um, that was, that was the, the main point of this first part, what I wanted to share. I think we have a break. Yeah, so you can speak with our Lord, stand up, stretch. But uh, So we'll connect, meet in a few minutes.
Can you break? Yes, can you? But we use this break to, to 